great group. This is wonderful. <laughs> really great. Um, this is Margie Gale, and she's a state geologist, and obviously you all want to hear what she has to say. So welcome. I'm glad you're yes. here. Um, this is being sponsored by the Dummerston Conservation Commission. We really have a strong commitment to having people from Dummerston and the region know what we have here so that we can make good decisions going into the future to protect our natural resources. And so this is one of a series of programs that you'll see a lot of you, I know, get the newsletter and you'll hear about these things. So, um, so welcome. This will, this will be on BCTV, so if you want to get some of it, it'll be on BCTV and we'll also have it on our website. Okay, this is not the first time I've given a talk in a church. I gave a talk in a church in Craftsbury and it was titled The Rock Shout Out and the first part of that talk was the rocks in Vermont rarely shout, they whisper and you have to look hard to decipher what they are telling us. So I will try to give you obvious things but it isn't always easy to decipher. And for those of you who looked at the map out there and we started talking about the complexities of that map, you kind of understand that. I don't have a lot of experience in Dummerston itself, but I did spend 20 years mapping the bedrock in Vermont, mostly in northern Vermont. But as I was looking through Dummerston, I said, well, it's a place between. It's between the Green Mountains, and so there's a view of the Green Mountains up by Camel's Hump looking north to Mount Mansfield and the Connecticut River. So I think that's a, a good way to start. We were talking about LIDAR earlier, and LIDAR is topography on steroids, light and distance imaging and ranging, and you can see phenomenal features on it. This is a slope map of the state of Vermont, and then I zoomed in, I put Black Mountain as our our geographic indicator, because I think most of you be able to follow that. So I'm going to go through geographic features, a little bit about bedrock, a little bit about our surficial or glacial deposits, and then how we, what we do with this information in a planning or uh, process. Right off the bat, you can see the Green Mountains coming down through here, and if you were looking on that map when we were talking about Precambrian basement, there it is right in there. And here's the Champlain and Vermont Valleys, the Taconica Lock Fonds. Over here is Black Mountain. This is all that Silurian Devonian section that we said came in um, around 300, actually 418 million years ago or so. So these are the sorts of maps that we used to have before LIDAR, but this one shows you the main physiographic regions in the state of Vermont. Champlain Lowlands in Vermont Valley, Taconic Mountains, the Green Mountains, and what now are called the Western, up, Western New England Uplands. They used to be um, a Piedmont and Northeast Highlands. Basically, the Uplands and you are down here somewhere, uh, as a dissected plateau with narrow valleys. Um, it's glaciated and also called the Vermont Piedmont. Another, the place between, we also have two different drainage systems in Dummerston, the West Williams and Saxons River, and then right about at Black Mountain, that water all flows to the west and then on to the Connecticut. On the other side, it flows directly to the Connecticut. So you have a drainage divide running right through town. Those same features that you see on the geography, you see on geologic maps. So this is a very, you've seen the very detailed map out there, this is a generalized geologic map of the state of Vermont. So again, the Champlain and Vermont valleys, mostly limestones, marbles, quartzites, um, on a carbonate platform. 
built onto Laurentia. You know, Laurentia Mountains in Canada? Think of that as a big continental mass and a platform of, carb of sands and limestones being built on that. Um, as you get farther out to sea, you have a slope and a rise, and the Taconic Mountains were originally deposited as sediment in that slope rise environment. As the, day, as the evening goes on, we're going to work a depositional sequence as well as a deformation and metamorphic sequence, okay? First, you have to deposit everything before you can deform it. So, for starters, we're looking at depositional environments. The Green Mountains and the rocks that cover them, the Green Mountains themselves are 1.4 billion years old. They were igneous rocks originally and sedimentary rocks originally. They're now gneisses. They're covered with a series rifting. When continents split apart, they rift. And the rift sediments are called riftoclastics. We also get volcanics in that environment. So they're interbedded. And so we have rift chemistry volcanics as well as sediments. Mark, then, Mark, did you mind if some of us ask questions as you go along? I don't, but I have a lot of slides. Okay, or maybe we should just wait, and if we have questions at the end, we'd rather better off. Because you'll probably answer them as we If we along. start, because I've done it that way before, <laughs> and we'll, we <laughs> won't, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we can do it that way. No, but let's wait okay. to the end. <laughs> <laughs> then, I'm not giving you all of these. Four arc and arc deposit. That means an island arc. This. These settings are giving, in your brain, you should be saying, wow, ocean? So this had to be in an ocean. Volcanic arcs, like in Japan? Wow. So we had volcanoes here. And volcanic arcs colliding with the continental margin. Then we have this big, broad swath of blue. Those are now metasedimentary rocks but they were originally limestones and sands and muds in a big, deep trough called the Connecticut Valley Trough. Um, all the rocks from here to the west were metamorphosed and deformed 460 million years ago and older. At that time, all the rocks from here and east, including the majority of what is in Dummerston, <coughs> were not in the picture. Okay? Those are sediments that are deposited in a post Tiponian <coughs> trough. And they get metamorphosed at around 360 million years ago, and that's when we also get our granites. So to help you visualize this, how many know plate tectonics? <laughs> Most, okay. <laughs> um, so plate tectonics, the surface of the earth, is, is a series of plates that move around. They split apart and they collide. Where they're colliding right now, for instance, on the west coast of California, okay, the one plate is diving down under the other and kind of sliding by. So throughout time, plates rift and they collide and they move around on the surface of the Earth. So the red star, if we start at 650 million years ago, the red star is where <coughs> what is going to become Vermont was, down in the <laughs> South Pole. <laughs> so bear in mind, so how fast do these plates move? <laughs> 10 centimeters a year? So you know, we're talking about huge masses of land moving Hello. this far. <laughs> so Vermont as we know it did not exist. That's 650 million years ago, however, the supercontinent of Rodinia was rifting apart. By the Middle Ordovician time, we're up near the equator, and the map over there shows you, if we look at the rocks now in the state of Vermont, the purple rocks were in existence 
back here at 650 million years ago, the orange rocks were in existence now at 458 million years ago. You notice Dummerston doesn't have any rocks in it yet. There is no Dummerston. <laughs> um, but by the time we get to the early Devonian, we have had deposition and all the green, and pretty much most of the state is filled in except for the granite. So the changes, this history is in the rock record in Vermont. That's the only way we know what this history has been is by studying the rocks. Notice, all the rocks in Vermont, they're there way before Pangaea, okay? Pangaea is 255 million years. That's younger than the majority of rocks in the state of Vermont. And then last, rifting to open the Atlantic, and that's close to where we are now. So what happens when plates collide? Here's examples of different colliding uh, margins. The heavy oceanic crust tends to sink and melt. When it does, volcanoes come up. I'm not sure what, why I have two of these, except this is a very thick crust versus a thin crust. And then we have two continental crusts, which Eventually, one will not sink anymore and the subduction will stop. Um, this one shows uh, not only volcanics, but also the rocks that form from, from a liquid as igneous rocks. If they come out on the surface, they're volcanics. If they cool at depth, they cool slowly. All the crystals have time to grow and you have a beautiful coarse grain granite that blasts out onto the surface. Uh, fine grain glass, okay? The other diagram that I love, which we won't go into right now, is this one, which shows, right in here is, is what one might call an accretionary prism. And when, the, when everything gets dragged down into the subduction zone, it comes from being at low temperature and pressure to higher temperatures and pressures. And when that happens, you get all different minerals and metamorphic minerals, okay? So all our rocks in Vermont are, meta almost all, are metamorphosed. And this gives you an idea of the temperatures and the depth in kilometers to get, like the amphibolites and the green schists that we have here anywhere from 400 to 800 degrees and 10 to 40 kilometers down. Everything that was above those has been eroded away. Okay, so we're looking at deep mountain roots when we're looking at rocks in Vermont. I have a couple more of these basic geology slides before we go on. So because I asked this question of some adults the other day. Sedimentary rock. It forms in oceans. It doesn't form in a lake generally because it's never going to be get buried deep enough to become rock. It has to be buried and compressed and so it has to have layer upon layer upon layer of sediment, okay? And that happens in ocean basins. So the first rule in geology is sediment, sedimentary rock, is deposited in horizontal layers and the oldest is at the bottom and the youngest is at the top. When we were looking at that map, and we say, oh, there's old rocks on top of young rocks. Well, something has happened to do that because that is not a normal depositional sequence, okay? When rocks collide and they're down deep, they're behaving like plastic, just like a plastic ruler. And, and some kind, sometimes they're really soupy, um, very elongate and stretched. Other times, well, they're, you know, depending on the temperatures and pressures, they're like a hard plastic ruler. And if you bend it far enough, it might break and move. Okay, so they can go from brittle to ductile. But here's an example of a thing called an anticline. 
And you rarely get to see these beautiful folds in Vermont, but this is a classic up in Moncton area called the oven. So the anticline you can remember is an A, like an A? Like an A, it points up. And the syncline sinks. Syncline, anticline, syncline, anticline. This is what it looks like under ground, and here's oldest to youngest, but on a flat map pattern, you just see repeats. You see this one, that one. Okay, so you see the repeating pattern of the same unit over and over again. If it were just a flat section tipped on its side, it would just be stripes across the map. To make things more complicated, you don't just have one fold generation. Rarely in Vermont do we have just one. We have two, three, four, five, and we have two, three, four, five different generations in most places in the state. And so if you get one, one anticline and then a second one in the opposite direction, so you folded something, let's say you did this, there's our first one, and then I fold it again. Well, then I fold it this way. Okay, and then I chop off the top. <laughs> I get what looks like an egg carton, a dome and basin pattern. And if you don't believe me, here is one, right? That it makes little concentric rings, and there it is in map pattern. In Dummerson, you have the Guilford Dome. It has a shape like that. Dome and basin. The other thing we talked about were a number of <coughs> deformities where rock has been deformed, exposed at the surface, eroded, and then new rock deposited on top of it. So you might see structures coming in that truncate against new rock. So here's an example of an unconformity. All these rocks are in here in that angle, and then these are flat on top, okay? So, and it indicates a period of erosion, no deposition, it can be, a, some of them are very large gaps in time. So Vermont, here we are. When we've already talked a little bit about unconformities, we have a big one. At the base of this blue and pink unit that comes down through the state, all the rocks to the east are young, 423 to 360 million years old is when they were deposited and metamorphosed. The unconformity at the base distinguishes them from the older rocks, Proterozoic Basement, 1.4 billion to 900 million, and then the Cambrian Ordovician section above that. But you can see the complicated map pattern in all the rocks to the west, and it's nowhere near as complex when you come to the east. Two different, um, one deformation event affected here before these were deposited. Once these were deposited, they were all deformed together. And so the West, metamorphosed, let's start at the bottom, sedimentary and, and igneous rocks that were basalts, volcanics, composition of rift, splitting a part of a continent to a mid-ocean ridge basalt, <coughs> to island art volcanics. All that is on the West of that unconformity, as well as the Proterozoic basement and there's an unconformity between these two as well. All of the rocks on the west were metamorphosed. Well, we now have, as geology has gone on, our dating methods have become more sophisticated. So while we used to think of the taconic orogeny as just one event lasting about 10 million years, now we have metamorphic ages going back to 505. So we have metamorphism happening way out in the ocean while we still have deposition happening against the Laurentian margin. So we have to start the taconic orogeny sooner 
and eventually the island arc comes in and collides with Laurentia and the Taconic orogeny comes to an end. Then all of that metamorphosed in the Akkadian orogeny. There's where what it looks like around Akkadian time, okay? With small, an island arc has already collided and smaller continents are colliding, Avalon, and next up will be Gondwana. That will come in further up our time scale. So we have, that's good, in the east, most of Dummerston, sandy marbles and gray phyllites metamorphosed 360 million years ago, and then granite intrusions. This just shows you with the arrows where that unconformity is again. And the major features in Dummerston, really, are that unconformity, the Guilford Dome, and I already talked to you about what a dome looks like, the Black Mountain Pluton, which is your granite, and then, fast forward to 18,000 years ago, not 360 million, to get to Glacial Lake Hitchcock. So when you're standing on sands and gravels on the surface and your foot is on the rock, you've got like 360 million years. <laughs> <laughs> this just shows you in terms of rocks, what that unconformity might look like. Here's folded rocks of the Moore Town. Beautiful, tight. Remember we said, oh, sometimes they can be soupy looking sorts of folds. Here they are. There's the unconformity. A conglomerate, pebbles and cobbles on top. That's a high energy, shallow water environment. And then the Waits River sandy marble above that. And here's the unconformity in the map pattern. But there it is, if you were to put a group of rocks together to see what it might look like. These are just more examples of what you have for rocks in Dummerston. The Waits River is a lot of impure sandy marbles, marbly quartzites, um, dark gray phyllites and schists. Most of them have calcite in it. This has implications for richness of communities and why the soils are so great. As soon as I go to the very western side of the town, and I get into Moore Town and Cram Hill, I get into the quartz-rich rocks of the Green Mountains, and the soils change, as do my, um, as does my water quantity, probably. So I get all sorts of implications in terms of groundwater, surface water, um, biodiversity, natural communities, soils, just based on tectonic history of the state. Again, just driving home that these things are folded. They're rather spectacular. Multiple generations of folds. Here's, here's one that came in here, back there. So the first fold is this one. And then that was folded by this. And this is folded by this. There's your three fold generations. Um, Gaia Mountain is a more quartz-rich one. Standing Pond Amphibolite was originally a basalt. And the Black Mountain Pluton, the youngest. Here it is in, this is a cross section. If instead of looking at a map pattern, you could cut down through the surface and see a cliff face, like a ledge face, it would look like this. Here's the surface, this line, is the surface of the Earth. When we did these cross sections though, we thought, wow, Nobody's going to have a clue what's happening unless we draw it above the ground and connect these units up. So you can see these folds and you can see that they're offset along faults. And you can see that uh, the Black Mountain granite is even cut by a fault. So that fault has to be a very young fault because we know the Black Mountain granite, we can get a real age date. We don't have many fossils in Vermont and we don't have many rocks that are, when they get deformed, it gets more and more complicated to get age dates. So this is a key one for giving, putting an anchor in the ground to give us an age date. We can say yes, so those structures are older or younger than that 368 granite.
and now we're going to fast forward out of bedrock into glacial history. What are we doing time-wise, okay? This is just, I have this time scale in the presentation, so you can kind of look through it. It has all the different orogenic events and New Hampshire series are different than the White Mountain Magma series. White Mountain Magma series is very young with the opening of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, New Hampshire series are down here at 360. And then way up there is Glacial Lake Hitchcock. And so we have sands and gravels from glacial times on top of highly fractured bedrock. So if I dropped rainwater on the top of this section, down through the sands and gravels, it would flow quite readily and easily. And then it hits bedrock, and it is not flowing through that bedrock. The only place it's going is along fractures or bedding planes. And I have a number of, I have fractures in this orientation, I have fractures in this orientation, I have fractures in this orientation. So I have lots of pathways, but once water hits bedrock, it even if it's moving in a general direction, it really is confined to specific <coughs> pathways. When you drill a well, you hope to intersect <coughs> those pathways. Mm -hmm. So here's our same globe 18,000 years ago, and the white is glacial ice, the Laurentide ice sheet covering North America. Um, each time the glaciers advance, they scrape away some of the surficial deposits that were there before them, they scrape away some of the bedrock and they leave new deposits. As glacial ice retreats, instead of advancing over the landscape, as it retreats, it forms a series of dams. So ice is this way. Imagine water is flowing off the front of the ice. It can't flow that way. So we have these lakes that have been formed, Glacial Lake Hitchcock, Glacial Lake Winooski, the Champlain Sea. Glacial Lake Winooski is kind of funny, it kind of ends right there, that's because that's where the ice was, right? So when the ice backed up, we had Glacial Lake Vermont, which drained out to the south, and when it backed up even farther, we depressed the continent with the weight of the ice, and the Atlantic flowed in, and we had salt water in the Champlain Sea. All of that is young compared to our bedrock history. So in your town, you have deposits associated with the advancing ice and associated with retreating ice. So this is a surficial geologic map of glacial deposits. Most of it is till, and I'm gonna show you pictures. Till is hard, compressed, it's under the ice and it, you walk up to a, a cliff face by a brook with a hammer thinking you're just going to dig right into it and it's like hitting concrete. It's really compact, compressed material. Then we have in the valleys of the West River, as well as along the Connecticut, pebbly sands, fine sands, lake sands, varved clays, all of those are associated with the ice retreat and with a glacial lake. Lake Hitchcock. Those matter. You care about some of these because came terraces and some of these fine sands are really good um, for infrastructure. Okay? They're also good for siting septic systems mm -hmm. and for developing in, in certain areas. So they're a source of sand and gravel and they're good for water systems and, and for septic systems. So they help kind of think about areas that you look at for development. Just examples when the glaciers came through, there's glacial striations. One set going this way, and can you see the ones going that way? Mm -hmm. two, different, two different orientations, so the ice moved in one direction and then another and scraped off. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of Alaska where ice has recently retreated. It's just gray, rubbly dirt and rock. And there's no living things growing on it. Um, so when it erodes, it cuts all the way down to the bedrock. 
and you see um, you'll see the roundedness of exposed bedrock that's because the glaciers moved over it the glaciers didn't really carve the bedrock the bedrock had all those patterns from the tectonic history but the glaciers round and smooth and scrape things away this is an example of till that stuff I told you is so um, hard and massive like concrete is the most widespread surficial deposit in the state of Vermont it's generally 10 feet thick or less sometimes it's up to 100 feet and it's mostly in the uplands because the glacial lakes never rose to that elevation the glacial lakes were 800 feet glacial lake Winooski was up at 1100 feet so anything above that um, didn't have the other glacial deposits on it that that, that gives you a better idea of uh, how hard and massive the till is and and it has multiple sizes of, of material water can still penetrate and move through glacial till here's a came deposit where sediment accumulates either between land and the edge of the ice or between ice lobes and it's beautiful sorted deposits a lot of these become your sand and gravel pits so there it's worth noting where those are and and having them um, well sorted sands and gravels having that as a resource and that's just a till bank um, the same similar things happen with clay because it doesn't erode well, it tends to get very steep and then maybe undercut, and then it becomes a slope that will fail. The glacial lake deposits, on the other hand, tend to be very erodible, the sands, from surface erosion and runoff. And there's just two contrasting pictures of um, glacial lake deposits. There's the barbed clays, and you can uh, do seasonal dating using barred clays because in the winter the deposits are very fine and when they when things are, are melting and running off in the summer months there's higher energy so we get graded deposits that repeat themselves annually and this is just this matters because these deposits are porous and permeable some of them are impermeable some of them can act as a protective layer Sometimes groundwater will feed down from a mountainside in the bedrock underneath clay and it builds up a tremendous pressure head that's a beautiful well to tap into. So what do we do with all this information? <laughs> groundwater, that's one of our number one issues and probably a number one issue for all of you. Uh, so we look at water wells and we see the majority 95 percent are in bedrock so we care about our our bedrock wells and our fracture patterns but the average yield is 14 gallons per minute compared to overburden wells in the glacial deposits the average yield is 36 gallons per minute also the depth of well up here you can compare overburden to bedrock average depth and this just looks at overburden thickness in bedrock wells because all your well points <coughs> in the state of Vermont these are all the well points um, we have a hundred thousand wells overburdens just... overburden our glacial our soils surficial deposits glacial deposits okay um, sometimes called overburden you'd have to scrape it away to see the bedrock <laughs> um, but when you look at the well logs from a well driller that tells you what types of sufficient materials they went through and how far it was till they got to bedrock and we want to make a map like that for the whole state of Vermont because that's that's a big thing for developers to know that's a big thing for highway people to know they can do it site by site but to have a general idea to begin with of, of where it's thicker and thinner is very helpful and we also try to identify areas of higher and lower yield and we haven't done Dummerston yet 
The other reason for these maps are mineral resources. And you had several quarries here um, at Black Mountain, the granite there. There's also a slate quarry. And one of the things about mineral resources, that granite also happens to have some radioactivity associated with it. And this is something, when you're doing town plans, you might like to know about this, because here, here's the area of elevated radioactivity measured, indirectly measured from airborne um, flying with Geiger counters, and from stream sediment surveys. And that's associated with the Black Mountain granite, which has uranium in it. So you definitely should be testing your water. You definitely should be checking for radon if you're not already doing that. Um, the last thing that we do are landslide hazards. And you guys have had plenty of flood events and know the hazards there. But we also have rock falls and we also have, we have a big landslide, 12 acre slid in state lands up at the Waterbury Reservoir. And it's remaining active after two months. Um, so we're also working on a landslide hazard map with points. We've done one, two, three, and we're finishing this county and we have 1,800 points already in the state of Vermont. <laughs> Most of those will be high elevation associated with glacial lake clays and with steep slopes. However, here I don't have data to tell, uh, to inform anything about glacial lake Hitchcock sediments and how they, whether they pose a larger landslide hazard risk. And then of course earthquakes always come up, so there's where earthquake epicenters have been felt in the Northeast. Um, we feel a lot of the ones from Canada and from New York. We felt them from as far south as Virginia because crystalline bedrock transmits waves readily. Oh, landslides again. These are some, <laughs> this is the big one that's going on now in Waterbury. Um, here it is again. And this, right here, all the way out to the front, that you can practically back up into this area and you can see where that slid. There's a huge delta that's formed in the reservoir. Um, this is 200,000 cubic meters of material that has slid. Here's a slide up in Jeffersonville along our, a river in glacial lake sediments with a house hanging out over the edge. <laughs> That view of the river is not good. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's where I'll stop. Yeah. Yep. Questions? <laughs> yes? This is a question about quarrying. Um, I, know, I know a couple of places where the impure marble was quarried in very small um, um, dig, but serious because they're drill holes. What were they? What were they using that stone for? I imagine for road material and riprap. I don't know if this they would. It wouldn't be 1800s. a good building stone. This is in the 1800s. Then Probably. I don't know gravel beds for railroads. Hmm. Would they have crushed it for something? This is way out in the country. I don't know. I don't Sometimes there's a black phyllite that's associated with the sandy marble. And with the limestone and the black phyllite is a slate. So you can be in limestone then slate. So they could have removed all the slate and left the marble behind, left the sandy marble. The drill are in the marble. Right? So the drill you know that the drill hole is with quarrying, or was the drill hole something that somebody came after later? Well, it, it forms the wall of the little quarry. This is only like four or five feet high. Right. It's a little tiny thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. They might have taken blocks. 
I, I suppose, would just wonder if they ground it up and use it as a line source for their fields. Mm. Could have. You can, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm going to keep asking. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do we know which part of the earth those rocks came to Vermont? I heard the theory that came from West Africa. Is that a possibility? So, not the ones here. Okay. So, if we continued when we were looking at those plates, <clears throat> right in here, this is going to be Africa and it hasn't collided yet with, we're going through, here's Vermont, it amalgamates against Laurentia. We're still looking at Africa moving in from, from there, okay, before we finally collide and make Pangaea. So when it rifts apart, however, I don't really know. Do you know if any rocks from Africa are left here? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I've looked. I yeah, I don't believe so. Didn't they match them up so that they found similar rocks oh. in Africa and here? Well, you match up. You can match up the plates, the configuration of the continental plates. Yes, I usually think more that our Appalachian Mountains continue over into Europe, into Scotland and Norway. Yep. So is, how do we differ from New Hampshire? We're always talking about how different we are from New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> In many ways. <laughs> so for one thing, <coughs> Where's my time scale? Right here, you're not gonna be able to see this too well. But the eastern portion of New Hampshire, as well as Maine, you have Laurentia, you have our margin, you have the island arcs collide, you have the Silurian Devonian section, and now you have a continent approaching. It's Avalon. It's not yet Gondwana. It's some small, smaller continents. We have pieces of that Precambrian basement over in eastern New Hampshire. Okay, with that collision, you also get the White Mountain magma series. Okay, so most of most of the rocks are younger. They're associated with continental margins from the other side of the Iapetus Sea. Okay. So. They end up amalgamated or assembled. What, what about at the Connecticut River? Here? So at the Connecticut River, that is still a discussion that is being <laughs> <laughs> Whether you continue the geology, whether you have fault contacts there, whatever you do, some Ordovician rocks reappear along that edge. So in days gone by, we used to bring these same Ordovician rocks up and over on the other side, mm -hmm. okay? Um, now people are more apt to say, no, those are entirely two different sections of rock. And we shouldn't be connecting the Ordovician rocks from the Green Mountains with the ones over there to the east. But is still a discussion. But in general, the rocks in New Hampshire are younger than the rocks over here. So we're much more mature here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and two questions. One is the Adirondacks, are they younger also? Or no. Older. No. Okay. And then the other thing is, what is the state geologist? You are the state geologist. But it's a, there's just one, you. Historically, just one. It's I'm the 14th. Okay, because okay, because there there used to be a bedrock, a different map. Yes. When I was in college in the old days. Yep. Um, so, so, so wait a minute. What was your first question before we got to Adirondacks? Adirondacks. So the rocks of the Adirondacks 
go to 2.6, you know, ours are 1.4 billion. Adirondack rocks go back to 2.6 billion. You go further into Canada, you get back to 4.6 billion. Okay, so they get older and older and older. The Adirondack Mountains, however, there is some uplift That's what happening. So the mountain ranges, the topography of them, you might think of as being younger, but the rocks in them are, are not. They're older, okay? So state geologists, so I'm the 14th. The first one was 1845, I think. And we had the first state geologic map in 1861, same year as the Civil War, right? The next one, 100 years later, in 1961, and this one, we made sure to get 50th anniversary, so we got 2011, and that was intentional, mm -hmm. to get it released at, oh, at one of those anniversaries. The first map, because mapping hadn't been done before, and because we were in Civil War times, and was all about resources, mm -hmm. and we didn't have um, the idea of, stra of stratigraphy, mm -hmm. they didn't have fossil control, I'm not even sure where we were with evolution and all of those ideas, okay, this goes way back. Uh, so that map mapped broad regions of the state, but it mapped all the little gold deposits in streams and that kind of thing. It's on our website, so you can easily go see it. The next map in 1961 was all about developing stratigraphy. What was older, what is younger, and trying to get big groups of rocks of various ages and relating them to rocks in Canada and rocks in Massachusetts. So it was a real stratigraphic um, map. So somewhere in there, plate tectonics comes along, not in the first map, in the first map, there were these downwellings and sediment went in and there were upwellings and there weren't great reasons for it. And so Vermont was mapped as a, from the Green Mountains to the east, a, a continuously younging, younging stratigraphic sequence. And uh, in the meantime, with one of our world wars, they discovered that volcanoes tended to line up in a pattern. Seismic activity tended to line up in a pattern. And we started getting the idea of tectonic plates. And then when I was first in college, plate tectonics, it wasn't like all this delicate, intricate shifting. It was like, boom, they collide. And they're <laughs> perpendicular. And one goes down and one goes over the top. And then that became a very refined science as we develop better ways to date things. Geochemistry, which lets you distinguish rift from mid-ocean ridge basalt from island arc, was being developed in the late 60s, early 70s, okay? And those give you different tectonic environments. So all that is built into the new map. And now, and with the plate tectonics, you know, now, we can go see real pillow basalts. We can see all our ways to detect information are, are different. Thank you. Yes? Um, is there any relationship between um, the Green Mountains and um, mountains running along through New York? I once read somewhere that the Green Mountains may have slid. So you're thinking of the Taconic Alakthons, I think. Okay. And, or of the Catskill Delta? I'm not sure because when, when plates were colliding, we had higher elevations, okay? Um, at some point, Vermont ends up high and dry and no more rocks are being deposited and no more collisions are happening. Everything's eroding away, but so, large volumes of material were deposited to the west in the Catskills. But the Taconic Alakthons, which extend into New York, 
are from the Laurentian margin that were faulted up on top. So here's Laurentia. Here's out here is a rift, and we have conglomerates, and eventually we have quartzites, and that tells us I had a nice sandy beach, and then I have rising sea level, and with that rising sea level, I go from a nice sandy beach to some limestones, to some shales, and I get this whole sequence. <clears throat> the Taconica lock ponds are older slope and rise deposits which were faulted up on top of carbonates of the margin. So deposited further east, now residing in New York. <laughs> Does that help? Is it accurate to say they were, went over the Green Mountains to do that? That's also up for discussion. <laughs> they could have, there's no reason that they could have originated on the west side of the Green Mountains, too. Could you speak a little more about the volcanic history? Uh, when and duration? And also, is, am I correct that the Scutney is, is the main uh, visible example of where it was? And are there other examples around? So, we, we should go look at the map out there. But, we have metamorphosed volcanic rocks here in the 1.4 to 900 million year old rocks. We have metamorphosed volcanic rocks up there that were associated with the opening of Iapetus. Those are 554 million years old. We have mid-ocean ridge volcanic rocks coming down through here. They're around 500 million years old. And we have island arc volcanics that are 440 million years old. Then we have volcanic, they're not really volcanic. Mount Scutney is the roots of an old volcano. But Mount Scutney is very young. It's one of the few that's here. Most of the rocks like Mount Escutney are in New Hampshire. Okay? We have a few, we also have these little narrow intrusives called dikes that occur. And those are younger. Those are all associated with the opening of the Atlantic. Okay? The Black Mountain granites and the granites to the north are associated with the collision of Avalon with Laurentia. They're older again, they're 300. So you have, if you really look, you have volcanic rocks a billion years old up to 185 million, right? So you have a whole suite of igneous rocks. None of those tell you where the actual arc was. And Escutney is not part of that volcanic arc. Okay? It's much younger. Are petro petroglyphs something that you track or...? Archaeologists. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit of... I've heard a lot in reading geology about traces, like the Escutney trace. Um, and does oh. that mean that you, they're, they're finding remnants of that rock in certain parts of the country outside of that area? The boulder trains. Is that what you've heard of? The Escutney boulder train? Well, I've heard it called trace. Well, that's when glaciers move through. Right. And they plucked off pieces. Mm -hmm. And the direct, you know the direction that the ice moved by seeing where those boulders are. So they've been carried, and I think that's what you mean by the trace of the, usually it's the trace of the Escutney, it's a famous boulder train. And because that geology is unique, 
and they yes. can trace it back to because, the Stepney? Because we don't have the composition of these rocks um, are low quartz, they're called cyanites, and we don't have those. Ice was moving from the northwest in this direction. We don't have any cyanites back here. So it's a, it's a distinctive rock type that lets us follow the boulder train. If you find, just like we find pieces of Precambrian basement on the other side of the Green Mountains up here, we know it had to come from Canada because we don't have a place to get it in Vermont and the rocks are all too young. So yeah, there are distinctive, some lithologies are very distinctive. So I think I read that um, in the tills that they might have only come from tens of kilometers away, but the, but the boulders might have come from hundreds of miles away? Well, I don't know how far we could look it up on, oh. I don't know if it's on here or not. It's on this map. So you saw a bedrock map, but this is a map of the surficial deposits. And all the pink is glacial till. And the things, <laughs> then you see everything that's in the valleys. But I was looking to see whether they have anything about the boulder train. Really uh, no, but I don't know how far, what the southernmost extent of that is. Glacial till, it, you don't really know. We did a till chemistry trying to end looking at fragments, trying to see how far some of it has traveled. And, you know, most everything is, is fairly close to its source, and then just a few fragments as you get several to ten or more kilometers away. So we have a couple of huge, in many of us, huge... Um, Erratics? Erratics! Huge. Mm -hmm. yes. If we looked at those, could we tell where they came from? Depends on the rock type. Okay. If, if it's this rock type, which goes all the way <coughs> to the Canadian border, <coughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good luck with that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, if it's something distinctive, then yes. Okay. Yes? How do you go about assessing the risk of future earth shifting in the Vermont area? Earthquakes or...? So, right now, we know where active plague boundaries are and we know that we're not on one, okay. okay? The closest one to us is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, mm -hmm. okay? So that doesn't mean that stress doesn't get transferred through the crust, it does. And one thing we know, like if you ever have a piece of wood that you've broken apart and glued back together, if you go to break it again, chances are it's gonna break where you glued it. So. <laughs> Same thing with the Earth's crust. Once it's been broken apart and put back together, if it's gonna break apart again, it tends, it might very well break on old fault surfaces. But that said, we don't have any, we don't have enough earthquakes in the Northeast to be able to map distinct surfaces at depth that would, would say, wow, we have an active fault zone down there. Um, you have to have some enough that have happened to be able to build a model like that. Are there shifts so, going on all the time, though? That, oh, yes. That we might feel occasionally. Yes. So we feel we feel them from Virginia. We feel them from there is a little zone up in Canada <coughs> near Montreal. We feel those. Um, I'm not sure what's happening over in the Tamworth area in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. but. They get earthquakes, um, and we feel those. So, yeah. But volcanic activity is no volcanic kind of activity. Yeah. But there was volcanoes. There, so there were volcanoes here, but for volcanoes you have to have a plate diving down and melting, 
okay. or high heat to melt the lower part of the crust to generate liquid, or like Hawaii, the plate is sliding over a hot spot. So Hawaii, the volcanoes form, they move off the hot spot and new volcanoes form. As so the with plate the climate moves. change, is that likely to have any impact? No. will have an impact on sea level rise right. and glaciers, but I wouldn't expect it to have anything to do with volcanic activity. I saw an example of a stretched pebble. Yes. And um, and I saw it in New Hampshire, so I don't know if that's something they would have and we wouldn't. We do. Okay. And it looks like a column of... Like, so, when we said when they're buried, they behave like plastic, that's all it takes. And then things... Sometimes, sometimes you even see layers that will pinch and swell and pinch and swell and called boodens. So you can see boodens. Okay. So you can see how something has stretched. Yep. And when rocks are deformed, you know, they get they get flattened and elongate. Especially if there's faulting associated with it, they elongate in the direction of the fault movement. Oh. Yes. So one of the things I love about Vermont is that the state geologists would come to Dumbness. <laughs> 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 and so what I'm curious about is like what agency do you work oh. in and what kind of staff do you have and do you have internships? Do you have graduate students? Do you have yeah. Okay. So what's your since time you began the geological <laughs> survey has been one to three people. And then we have graduate students who work with us and from all different universities. So they're free labor for us because they're working on a master's thesis. Uh, we fund a position at Norwich, but it's on soft money. So we write grants all the time to fund our work. Um, and the projects we're working on now. So PFOA contamination of groundwater in Bennington, okay? Ordinarily, waste management might have dealt with issues of um, a spill, and a spill on sands and gravels, and you dig up the sands and gravels, cart it away, put clean material, and your site is cleaned up. The, the issue in Bennington, that was airborne. It was airborne for a number of years. It went everywhere. More than that, it was it went to the wastewater treatment facilities and was used as composted sludge, so it got spread all over town. So, right, multiple things happened. People who worked at the facility loved the barrels, so they took barrels home, washed them out, and dumped them on the ground, so it got spread that way. It entered the groundwater, got into fractured bedrock, and in a large, like 17, 20 square mile area. So we got involved in that project, and with us, um, because they were interested, came SUNY Plattsburgh, who has a great camera that can go look down the hole and see where water is flowing in and where it's flowing out. We can age date the water, so a fellow in at UMass was doing age dates for us. So we have groundwater, that's five days old and groundwater that's older than 70 years old, right? That's not contaminated because it's in someone's well, it's traveled underground, it's reached someone's well, but it's never been fed by the, the young surface water. So, and we have all mixes in between. And so, so that project has John Kim from our office, it has SUNY Plattsburgh, it has UMass, it has UVM, it has Middlebury, it has EPA, and it has USGS, all working together. So that's, we get a lot done by having partnerships like that. Um, so that's the biggest example of what, what you're asking. So that's one issue we're also doing the landslide hazard because, um, well, someone called me and they said, I can't let my kids play in my backyard there are huge boulders falling from the cliffs and I invested my life savings here and I felt like wow you know people don't know how 
necessarily to look around them and say, mm -hmm. I shouldn't be building at the base of a cliff. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't buy a house there. I shouldn't be building at the top of a cliff. I shouldn't be building right next to the river. I shouldn't be building my house right next to the overlook of the river. I mean, what do I do for buffer zones? And I felt like, well, we should have a landslide inventory because generally landslides happen where they've occurred previously. So once you have, and you can see the old ones on LIDAR, so once you have the inventory, at least there's a guide, some sort of guidance for people to be able to say, wow, I, I should reconsider how I'm developing land in those areas. So those are our big projects. And we do it with lots of partners. <laughs> yes? You had a slide that had, in our area particularly, little round, reddish round spots, just spots everywhere. And I missed what you thought they were. So it was the ones that... Uh, Groundwater? No, the, all the, the paint from the surface. They were just little dots. It was towards the end. They weren't wells. No, they weren't wells. Yeah. It was like, they were this. Like little no? It was almost like they were, um, mm -hmm. like maybe a slate, a slate um, mine course. or something like that. Or mm -hmm. uh, you did identify. You can look through and after we're done and see if you can find All it. the way at the <laughs> end. Mm -hmm. like the, the yeah. Go ahead. What was your question? Uh, how how do scientists know the ages of some rocks? 1.2 billion years versus 18,000 years. <laughs> so we have a multiple ways to date rocks now. Originally, it was fossil control. Okay, so you you would get relative ages of fossils. However, if fossils are occurring in a rock that you also know the date of, then you can link that fossil to a real age date. So how do you get the real age dates? There's minerals called zircons. Um, you can get age dates from some micas. It's not radiocarbon dates, so it's uranium lead, rubidium strontium, and potassium argon. So you have the parent amount and how long it takes to decay to the daughter product. So you look at the parent and the daughter, do the chemical do an analysis, and are able to calculate the radioactive age dates for the different rocks. Plenty of rocks we can never get dates for. That's why it's so important um, to have, like, the Black Mountain Granite that has a good solid date and you can repeat it multiple times and get that age. And so that lets you say, well, those are younger, these are older, relative to when that rock intruded, okay? And they, we also have things called cooling ages. So a mineral called amphibole, at 500 degrees, it locks in potassium argon and when it cools below that, you maintain a certain amount of potassium and argon. So you can use those cooling ages as well. So specific minerals and specific rocks. Um, yeah. This is a curveball. Are there uh, any examples of meteor strikes in the state? No. <laughs> but if you go back, and I have to show you this, way up the beginning. Right here on LIDAR. Look up there. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> so how many questions do we get about whether or not that is an impact crater? It's not. It's the Nalhegan Basin. Okay? And the rim around the edge stands up high because it's been metamorphosed and it's and the rock is tough. In the middle, it's a whole bunch of igneous dikes and they're weathering away. So it's a topographic basement basin, but it's not an impact structure. But we get questions on that one over and over. <laughs> yes. You mentioned glaciation at eighteen thousand years ago. 
that was Glacial Lake Hitchcock at that point. Oh, all right. So yeah. ice had retreated, Glacial yes. Lake Hitchcock was there. So, but I've always heard that where we're, where we're sitting, for instance, was a mile below ice at one yes. point. Yes, at least. And, yeah. and then you hear this date all the time, 12,000, or time period, 12,800 years ago. And there's a little bit of a theory that is either accepted or not, and I'm wondering what you think of it, that comets sprayed across the northern hemisphere um, 12,800 years ago and changed weather patterns because of the melt that occurred. So I would then be looking for impact craters. <laughs> but but if, if they were ages. hitting ice, if they were hitting ice, would they get into the rock? If they were in the ice, then we would see them. Now we'd be able to collect them. Mm. Have you ever heard of this? I no. haven't ever heard this. I've heard no. this. No. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, so well, look at the, the ice sheet covered. Okay, wait a minute. Let's mm -hmm. just back up. Mm -hmm. The ice sheet. You know, glaciation starts 1.8 million years ago. Okay. Now we have multiple advance retreat, advance retreat, advance retreat. And then you get to the time period in Vermont where you're, where the ice is finally retreating back, okay? And the 18,000 to 12,008 is when the ice left this area. It now retreated back further to west of the Green Mountains. It then retreated back. So it was still slowly retreating, but it was a long period of time I don't know why 12th, I don't know where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of it or heard. So, so, so when you're, not necessarily in Demerson, I'm mm -hmm. just the group for this, but if you're up towards Wardsboro and you're up, and you up can towards see where? Wardsboro, Wardsboro. 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 literally 20 miles Down northwest of here. Mountain. And, okay. you're, and you're up at like 1,600 feet elevation and you'll see ledge. Uh -huh. And you'll see where the glaciers have worn the edges of the ledge off. Yes. But then over here, you're looking at what clearly came out of a stream bed or something because it's big, round, and rounded, and obviously deposited there by a retreating glacier. Or advancing or, glacier. Or an advancing glacier. So you, you don't or, know whether that came from the north or, or retreat or was left there as it retreated. Away. So I guess is my question. When the ice melts, it drops plenty of things in place. Yeah. Okay. Running water gives us nice graded deposits. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then there's stuff that just drops in place. Then within glacial lakes, there's ice rafted boulders. Mm -hmm. They're floating, you know, main mass of ice is gone and you've got an iceberg still floating around with a big rock in it, that melts and that drops mm -hmm. onto glacial lake sediments. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at it. So you don't know? You don't really know. You have where to that, look at where that all the... Really I don't know that it isn't a recent boulder mm -hmm. tumbled down and weathered and eroded by modern streams. You no, know, and you can tell in place, the surrounds is just totally different uh, way of The good news is the geology is like weather. It changes. Yeah, it's so I will say there, because this came up, and uh, you know, geology is a relatively young science. There's still, someone said, well, you have all these facts. And I said, but we learn more all the time. We couldn't date water. We couldn't detect PFOA. We had, we didn't know anything about plate tectonics. We have all sorts of new methods for looking at the rocks that we're studying mm -hmm. and taking ice cores and looking at pollen, looking at microscopic little fossil teeth and things. I mean, there's so many new bits of data waiting to be collected and new methods. And every time you use a new method and get more data, it changes your story. The best one, I love this one, is up in the Bolton area and down in West Bridgewater. We were mapping rocks as Lower Cambrian, 550 million year old rocks. And Greg Walsh 
found these little tiny microscopic fossil teeth in a, some dolomite pods. And those fossil teeth weren't 550 million years old, they were 360 <laughs> or 460 million years old. So what we thought were Lower Cambrian were really Ordovician. So that changed how you could interpret the rocks. And the beauty of then volcanic rocks, we have a rift volcanic, 571 million year old age date sitting on top of those rocks with the conodonts in them. So that's not a normal stratigraphic sequence, that's a fault. You got 571 on top of 460, and we all know normal <coughs> stratigraphic section is oldest at the bottom, youngest at the top, not youngest at the bottom and oldest at the top, right? So those things all happen during the course of making the map that you're looking at. Right. Okay. This gentleman over okay. here has a good question. Oh, yes. Could you speak to where and why limestone and marble occur where they do in the state? Through the karst bands? So it depends. The limestone and marble over here in the western part of the state, that's the majority of it, is there. The beautiful building stone marble. That is really because of its location in relation to the continental margin of Laurentia. So there's a big continental mass, and then we talked about the rift to deeper water, to sands, to limestones, and um, we even have uh, reef deposits, right? Shallow water reef deposits. So that's the reason, is its original depositional environment mm -hmm. um, on the, off the Laurentia margin as the carbonate platform of Laurentia margin. Right, but then why does it show up where it is? I mean, all the way over to Barry and different places. Like it doesn't that. show up all the way over to Barry. No. It ends. It ends right in here. Um, we can look at it out there on that map. Middlebury Synclinorium. There's a lot of it in there. Shelburne um, down through Dorset. And what you asked about karst is very true. That happens in the marbles because they dissolve readily. And there are places where you can endorse it. The springs, water comes up and you see it and you watch the brook and it dives into a hole in the ground and it's gone. And you look around, you can't find where it is and you walk a little farther and all of a sudden water will be coming streaming out of the side of the hill again. So it's a disappearing stream. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. That's karst. Um, in the making, or there already. <laughs> um, the Middlebury Marble Quarry blasted, and they had like a cavern, a big empty space um, in their quarry, which had was karst had been dissolved away. Yes, I heard that there's the world's most ancient coral deposit somewhere in the Northeast Kingdom. Does that sound familiar? Northwest Vermont. Northwest Vermont. The Chazy Reef of Isle Lamotte <laughs> is what it's called. For those of you who are interested, there's a fellow from Brigham Young University who just published free on his website, and I put a link on our website too, a field guide to the geology of northern New England. So he's got field stops in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, with beautiful pictures and brief descriptions. It's a fantastic resource, and it talks about the Shazy Reef as well. The name of the website is what? What is the name of the website? So our website, it's too long for me to tell you. Oh, I know what I have, though. I brought postcards. <laughs> I don't know if I have enough for everybody, but on the back of the postcard is, <laughs> yeah. I'll pass them around. Here. On the back of the postcard is our information and our website. And under what's new, I just put up a field guide to New England, northern New England geology, so you can click on it. It takes a while for it to download, but it's a really great it's a great resource. Good thing. Yes? This is great. Recently, uh, water in Westover, groundwater in Westover was tested 
positive versus on radioactive material. Do you know what that material was and if it's naturally occurring? Does it show up elsewhere? I don't know what that particular test is, but there's plenty of naturally occurring radioactivity in Vermont's groundwater. Also arsenic, um, also manganese. Um, so sometimes you think, oh, this is great tasting water, and it is, but you really should be testing. And radioactivity, there's some limestone units and conglomerate units um, that come down maybe through the Dover area, but the Precambrian basement is also, also higher in radioactivity. So we have a map. Just because it's in the rock doesn't mean it's going to get in the water. Um, you know, because water is moving great distances, but it's, everybody should test their water. Thank you all for coming. Ask the question, how do we get the state or geologist to come to Dumberston? I'll tell you. Be <laughs> yes. Uh -oh. <laughs> because we're really busy and people call all the time. Oh, do they? Yes. Yeah. However, you said, I really want people to use geology in the planning process and to know how to use it to answer questions. I said, how did I turn that one down? <laughs> <laughs>